As we come to the end of March, the market's been through, you know, multiple events uh, from the Indian budget to the U.S. Federal Reserve presenting its most recent meeting, a banking crisis, the Adani fiasco, uh, and all that is now priced in the market. The question is, what next? Because uh, we actually at crossroads on 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 this entire issue because. Uh, whatever is happening in the US, we can argue two ways. One is that you have a liquidity infusion happening, uh, which uh, has historically been supportive of markets. In fact, since October, many multiple rallies in the US markets have occurred at points of liquidity infusion, even though the Fed has continues to raise rates. So on the one side, raising rates is breaking something. On the other side, the liquidity is trying to rebalance that on a consistent basis. So what is really going to work? Uh, so we eventually end up looking at things like the dollar and that's of course been declining uh, since September and even recently after the bounce back has been falling for a while. On the other hand, uh, you have the Indian market which sort of deviated from January from, from global equities uh, and then continued to fall. So this is actually the fourth month consecutive that it is actually down. Uh, of course, the monthly closing is still a week away. But uh, we are four, mo four months falling uh, in this market and that's one of the longest streaks, I think longest since 9-11. Uh, the only thing is prior to 9-11 you had the Ketan uh, Parikh fiasco and then uh, a long lag because, uh, you know, uh, leveraged uh, uh, trading was sort of uh, put out of business with the Badla being removed and the new FNO system was then introduced and took a while and then 9-11 happened and, and that was the final capitulation point for at least the Indian market. U.S. markets uh, remained down for another year till they entered Iraq and then picked up from there. So that's just history. Uh, are we facing a similar situation? There have been a lot of events which are similar. But uh, and then again, this banking crisis also, you can draw similarities with 2008. Uh, but at the end of it, uh, what is different is that uh, banks were also bailed out in 2009. Uh, there was a lot of uh, quantitative easing which was done, which essentially meant uh, buying a lot of the bonds, credit, MBS securities uh, and that liquidity went to the banks. So banks never had a liquidity problem after that, which means their funding is good. Uh, H2M is a different issue, uh, which is also a fallout of uh, the new rules that were introduced in 2008-9 that well, you can mark a certain amount of the government securities as H2M. And that was already prevalent in India, so not, not a big issue. And that sort of is required because, you know, there are certain securities which you are holding to maturity long term. And therefore, you don't really need to mark to market and affect your profitability every quarter. Uh, and that's why it was introduced in India. You can only, the only thing is you probably need more uh, regulation and limits in terms of how much security should be marked and not marked and so on, which is already in India. I think we uh, saw that and already there, those things are in place. But US tends to be a more free country. Uh, they just allow you to do things uh, in your own way at certain beyond a certain point and that is where then uh, uh, regulation uh, becomes required when there's a crisis. So back to the point, are we at a point in time where uh, you know things are going to get worse because of the banking crisis or are we at a point where uh, you know we sort of discounted the worst or at least uh, for the time being uh, markets are getting extremely oversold. So it's a mix of both because on the one side, while, while we can extrapolate the banking crisis, the thing is for the time being, a lot has been done to backstop this problem. And the real issue might not be whether you have a banking crisis, but really whether the US goes into a recession. And of course, that can have linkages with the banking sector. Uh, but at this point of time, the sell-off in US banks, the bank index, has actually not caused a, a major collapse in say other parts of the market which is if you look at the S&P, you look at the Nasdaq, the Nasdaq is holding out much stronger uh, and that's not what you would have thought. I mean I had written about the US bank index uh, probability that you know it could do a wave C down in December uh, and then in January it looked like the S&P would rally which it did but the bank index uh, rally faded much earlier and now uh, what I thought in December in terms of the bank index is actually played out. But the surprise is that it has not played out along with a big sell-off in uh, the US markets themselves. So why did that happen? Why do we have such a big divergence between these two? Partly because of the liquidity infusion. And so that is where the catch is. Uh, does th do things get worse right away because we have liquidity infusion? 
or have we delayed the problem maybe for another 6 months and and that timing can be everything uh, in terms of which direction of the trade you really take because if uh, things start to look like they are improving for another 6 months and then rates are higher for longer and the eventual weakening of the economy shows up and drives the markets down months later uh, you have a long lead lag. Now I am not saying necessarily 6 months it could even be 2 months uh, but uh, the timing of it all is really going to be uh, critical in the short term because divergences are not necessarily good things. If only one sector moves and the other doesn't, it's the classic Dow theory, uh, you know, analogy that uh, it stated when if one sector of the market is doing well or and not being confirmed by the other, then is it really a trend reversal? So in this case, when one sector is doing badly and the others are not doing as badly, then is it a trend reversal or a sign uh, that the trend is in its late stages? and probably likely to change and so that's what we call an intermarket divergence. Now uh, our own market has very very different sentiment uh, signals so I'll just share a couple of charts one of them which I've written about many times since uh, December is this one which is the volume of puts traded to the volume of calls you may have heard that in my multiple spaces or interviews as well because uh, uh, this data actually was hitting new highs uh, the highest reading since 2009 uh, till February. But in March, it has actually taken out the 2009 highs, which means we're actually trading more puts than calls. If you just look at this red uh, point here compared to this, this line has been going up, going up, going up consistently. I thought this was already giving us an oversold reading, you know, in Jan, Feb, but it's continued even higher to a level that we've not seen since here, which is the end of the uh, 2008-9 uh, bear market. That's when the readings were this high. But the markets are not that down, you know, as they were. The news flow is as bad, but the markets are at an elevated level. And that really makes you question, why did that happen? But on the other hand, if it has happened, if sentiment is already so bad, are things going to really get worse? This is this is where, uh, this is where the uh, struggle starts in terms of understanding what markets are really doing. Because there's enough bad news to say that things can get worse. But on the other hand, uh, you have readings like this which can uh, tell you that uh, at least if, if nothing else in the near term it can mean that it's time for a relief rally uh, even if uh, if it's not uh, the start of a bullish phase it can be the start of a uh, stronger uh, bear market rally as well so both of the things you have to keep in mind now this is not the only data point uh, because if there was a single data point in Jan it was a single data point but now much more has got added up you may have heard of some of them and I'll just go to another chart and this one is the institutional setup which is the participant wise open interest FIIs and client is what this is reflecting the blue line is the FII and FIIs had a short position uh, in the month of the pandemic which had gone to almost 1,73,000 contracts here on the 6th of March. Of course after that the market continued to fall one way down and then only recovered. Now that's also a time when you know there was a ban on short sales. Sometimes people ask me why did shorts not continue down probably market fell so fast that you know, you wouldn't keep adding shots after a point, which has held on or started to cover them as it continued to fall. Now, what do you, but in a, you know, unless we are in that kind of a situation today, after four months, I mean, remember, this uh, fall ended in three months. So, the largest part of the decline in March of 2020 was the third month of that decline. We are now in the fourth month. Okay, so we've already fallen for three months uh, till the first week of March. Now, the fourth month is going on. And the short positions in the last uh, week or two have gone up to an even higher level, one like 95,000 contracts is now an all time record reading. Uh, the opposite of that is the client side, which includes HNIs, corporates, uh, you can say operators, however, all kinds of large traders, not just the small ones. And so who else would take significant long positions when markets are falling uh, or at the bottoms? And that's what it looks like a one like 53, 56,000 contracts long. Uh, is as high as it was in, 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 in the previous occasions. Now this data is of course updated till, uh, yes, I think it's still yes, yesterday or day, day before probably 22nd. I haven't put in yesterday night's data. But even there, I think we, we are just close to uh, reading on the client side being an, at an all-time high. Uh, just missing that by maybe, uh, maybe a little bit or just there yesterday. I have not, like I said, not checked on. Uh, but if I do check, uh, I do have the data point here. So yeah, there, see, it's it touched 153, it came down to 151. Uh, even yesterday, we've seen some reduction in shorts by FIs for the first time in many, many days. But like I said, these readings reached 
an all time uh, uh, an all time record so at 153 the last high reading year was 159 so of course client side is as high as previous but not at an all time record but there's another another one which is at all time record and this is the new participant which has become active since 2018 and that is the DIIs it's hardly spoken about uh, but the DIIs now have the largest long position since uh, covid since uh, 2020 when it was almost 66000 in fact just before the tax breaks uh, announced uh, by uh, the finance minister uh, in 2019 year we did have significant long positions by uh, domestic institutions almost 80000 contracts long and weeks before that it was close to around 70 uh, six or so. So right now we have a reading of almost 66, 68 thousand contracts long, which is uh, as high as those previous readings. Uh, this one is an, an equivalent probably, which is uh, way back in uh, 2018 uh, when it had fallen. This bottom occurred when DIs were long up to almost around 60, 68 thousand contracts. So that's the setup. Uh, and history always has shown that, you know, which part of the market is right. People try to, will try to think, oh, this guy is going to be wrong or that guy is going to be right. But history shows that near bottoms, uh, DIs have already ha had the maximum long positions and FI is the maximum short. Whatever the reasoning be, FIs tend to be more hedgers rather than directional trades. They are not really shorting to short the market, which is how people misinterpret it. Uh, but it's just that when they feel maximum fear, they're probably maximum hedged. And that's where we read it as a sentiment indicator. That sentiment is excessively bearish. And therefore, we may be getting to a point where markets can recover. The same with the volume PCR, which I discussed earlier. So I call these sentiment indicators. The idea of looking at uh, sentiment is essentially to understand how the markets feel. So this is how the markets are feeling. They're feeling extremely nervous, most nervous since 2009 which is the, or 2020, which are two previous bear markets. Uh, but the decline in the market is not as significant yet. Will it get is not clear because uh, typically such extremes should mean the worst is over. Uh, the fear in the mind is only of whether the US goes into another crisis and the question is now or after some time. So I think uh, my sense is there is time in between uh, and that is where the trade will show up. Uh, we should probably wait uh, wait a while before things get worse. Watch how, watch how the US markets and the liquidity situation unfolds. Uh, because rates are going to stay higher for longer, uh, which is something which uh, they've already said, even if they stop raising rates, they may remain at five, five and a quarter percent till the end of this year. And at some point of time that can uh, hurt the economy and slow it down to the point of a, or close to the point of a recession. So that is, I think, the risk uh, and the timing of it is what we really need to do. So that's all in this update. Thank you.